Hello again, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this Monday's edition of Alaska Weather. I'm Dave Percy, a meteorologist with the National Weather Service, and I'll be hosting today's show. And up first, uh, <clears throat> have a uh, chart here of the heavy rains that fell uh, across the Kenai Peninsula uh, during the day. Or actually, these are 24-hour amounts ending at 3 p.m. this afternoon, and uh, quite heavy. Pedro Bay actually... Uh, there near Iliamna Lake, uh, had four, point, four and three quarter inches in the last 24 hours. Port Graham there, southern Kenai Peninsula, across the bay from Homer, or we're actually a little farther, Soldovia across the bay from Homer, uh, with 3.39 inches. Port Graham, a little farther to the south, had 3.8 inches. Alieska there had 2.1 inches of rain. Actually, uh, South Anchorage, also, some areas had over an inch of rain there. Then it really cuts off as you head up to the north. And uh, probably honorable mention would go to Broadview and Kenai Lake. They had uh, over an, well over an inch of precipitation, as well as uh, Seward had uh, quite a bit, too. Kenai Lake and Seward both had uh, around two inches in the last 24 hours. And moving on to the uh, chart here, a lot of uh, yellow. This is uh, in the interior, mostly uh, wind advisories out uh, for the gusty winds uh, anywhere from 30 to 50 miles an hour going today higher elevation especially like Indian Mountain seeing gusts 48 miles an hour and then we've got uh, winter weather advisories for the Arctic coast for blowing snow reducing visibility to a half mile and the exception being here at uh, the eastern end of the Arctic coast there at uh, especially around Kort Kak Kaktovik and Barter Island uh, that's a uh, blizzard warning going there uh, for tonight and tomorrow, continuing with those winds out of the west gusting possibly as high as 50, 60 miles an hour. And th that with uh, blowing snow will create whiteout, whiteout conditions. And uh, wind weather advisory, Eastern Brooks Range. And then we've got a high wind warning out here for the Western Alaska Range area for winds gusting to 70 miles per hour. And uh, you won't see it that strong in McGrath. That's mostly over toward the Alaska Range. You could still see winds gusting maybe up to 50 miles an hour in the mcgrath Nikolai area. And the Bering Strait Coast here, St. Lawrence Island, high wind warning, or winter storm warning out uh, for the uh, area for tonight into tomorrow, continuing with uh, winds 60 miles an hour, maybe 65 miles per hour, maybe 70 miles per hour in gusts. And the high wind warning here for the uh, Portage Valley and Turnigan Arm area, as well as uh, East Anchorage uh, hillside, that ends at 6 p.m. this evening. And wind gusts anywhere from uh, 60, 50 to 60 miles an hour. Actually, the lower hillside Anchorage had gusts uh, close to 60 miles an hour in one of the uh, observing points there. And uh, as high as 70 miles an hour in Turnigan Arm. Those should come down this evening. And then down here, southeast coast, whoop, let me back up. That's a dense fog advisory that's out for the uh, greater Juneau area, Admiralty Island. And that's out until 1 p.m. Tuesday afternoon for dense fog. That means vis it reduces visibility to about a quarter mile or less. And that's the uh, threshold for calling it dense fog. And so advisory out there. And moving on to satellite imagery, you can see that next storm taking a path just about like the former one, the one over the weekend did, heading northwestward there just off the southwest coast across the Alaska Peninsula. And that southeast to northwest flow uh, really focused the heavy precipitation in uh, from uh, northern Kodiak Island across the Kenai Peninsula and then back in toward the Alaska Range there with uh, much lighter amounts up here to the northwest. But uh, a lot of wind is quite a wind producer again over a big area of the state over the into the interior. Otherwise, the southeast coast here, clouds and maybe a few showers along the central coast, and that's about it. 
Otherwise, you can see the uh, clearing here behind the front, kind of a wave looks like rippling up there toward Kodiak Island. So that may increase the rainfall a little bit there again, but uh, this front as it moves eastward will be weakening quite a bit and the low center as it pulls northwestward also will be weakening. Otherwise, out here to the west, we have, uh, looks like a weak system there staying south of the chain. Looks like it's dropping away and starting to fall apart here as cold air pours out of the Russian Far East here and heads due south over the western Aleutians where they had snow showers today out there at Chimianat too, all the way down to sea level, the snowfall levels down to sea level and kind of a mixed condition there, uh, Adak and Atka, but pretty more isolated and light and also uh, mixture of precipitation with the strong winds here over the southwest interior. Uh, let's see, Mountain Village gusts 45 miles an hour on those winds today, 30, 35 in the Bethel area, Cape Nuanem, Cape Ramanzoff, 60 mile an hour wind gusts, very windy here in the central interior back all the way up to the western Arctic coast with those winds again gusting 30 to 60 miles an hour here in uh, some areas, Delta Junction, 50, 60 mile an hour winds, and so the high wind advisory continues out for the eastern Alaska range and then the warning for the west side and the southeast coast. Few showers, actually moisture from this front already showing up along the coast here. We'll see for tonight that uh, weakens considerably and moves, drifts eastward there. So it's really not going to make too much uh, headway into the inside waters, at least tonight. And a few showers of this trough over Kodiak Island. You can see the front weakens considerably. The precipitation field with it starts to become quite limited here so there'll be mostly snow showers or very light snow uh, here by later tonight and then just some showers left behind over south central Alaska with diminishing winds. It stays quite windy here along the Yukon Cuscombe Delta, especially the Yukon Delta up to St. Lawrence Island and the Bering Strait as that uh, slowly weakening low center pulls back to the northwest to about the position the one is in today that hit us on the weekend tomorrow. So much nicer conditions for the uh, western interior. Not bad over the interior, just variable clouds, a few lingering snow showers or flurries. Southeast flow continues, another trough, more light rain will spread up to the Kenai Peninsula, not nearly as heavy as it has been. And uh, that remnants of that front here keep it kind of damp and cloudy over the panhandle. Then that next system, back one up here, coming up here you'll see moves up to the coast and weakens. Could be some gale force winds in association with that and rain. Otherwise, mostly dry here over the interior uh, with some clearing. Mixture of rain or snow mainly along the coast here for north or for southern Alaska and showers Kodiak Island and not much going on out in the west. Just a lot of cold air, snowfall levels all the way down to sea level, even down to the Aleutians. A pretty good batch here coming into the Fox Islands. Lows for tonight, uh, north slope Arctic coast anywhere from five below to five above. Otherwise, teens, Tanana Valley, 30s, southern Alaska, 30s and 40s for the Panhandle, upper 20s over the western Aleutians, highs tomorrow, teens and, uh, teens and 20s over much of the interior here, with mostly 20s as you head into the central interior, and it looks like highs in the mid to upper 30s here, southern Alaska, the near 40 or so, Kodiak Island, Alaska Peninsula, 40 to 45 for the Panhandle. And for Tuesday morning's lows, we're looking at... Uh, well above freezing there for the southeast coast, upper 30s to lower 40s, back below freezing a little bit here for south central Alaska Kenai Peninsula, upper 20s lower 30s, and then 5 to 15 there in the interior, and that actually extends all the way out to the Arctic coast with lows in the 20s for the Privilofs and below freezing out over the Aleutians, followed by highs lower to mid 30s for the Aleutians, single numbers up to the northeast over the upper Yukon Valley and teens along the Arctic coast. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. On to flying weather. First graphic here showing a big batch of IFR, Northern Bering Sea, St. Lawrence Island, into the Yukon Cuscombe Delta Coast, all the way over to, oh, about at least Dillingham there, and then VFR here to the north and the central interior. IFR Central Eastern Arctic Coast, some marginal stuff here on the east side that expands when you get down to the Alaska Range. 40 mile country here, the Copper River Basin, and then that becomes IFR, Prince William Sound, North Gulf Coast. IFR with that front lying just off the panhandle. And VFR for the central western Aleutians. And for uh, tomorrow afternoon, still some areas of VFR out here over the Bering Sea, but generally marginal for the Aleutians. And uh, IFR in the northern Bering Sea, St. Lawrence Island toward the Bering Strait. Patch IFR there, central and 
part of the eastern Beaufort Sea coast. So it's pretty good up here for the Brooks Range and North Slope into the uh, Kobuk and part of the Koryukuk Valley. It's a marginal VFR, central interior, and mostly marginal here on down to Kodiak Island with the IFR, Prince William Sound, up across western Copper River Basin, Talkeetna's, and marginal for the Panhandle. And for uh, Wednesday morning, uh, looks like there's some IFR there from the uh, North Slope Central areas on out to the Central Arctic Coast. VFR to the east, VFR to the west, and that extends all the way down across Seward Peninsula and Norton Sound, uh, right into Cook Inlet and the Kenai Peninsula, and likely the Manuska Susitna Valleys as well. Otherwise, Central Interior here, marginal VFR with some areas of IFR, a band of IFR, Kodiak Island, right up along southern coast of the Kenai Peninsula there. Probably won't get into uh, Seward, so they'll be marginal and marginal VFR Prince William Sound. IFR again, right along and off the southeast coast and mostly marginal out over the Bering Sea, except for some IFR in the north central Bering. And for the afternoon on Wednesday, we've got IFR slipping on into the southern pan end, with always marginal VFR, up all the way across Lynn Canal Glacier Bay to the border. IFR up into western Prince William Sound. VFR, downsloping, due to downsloping wind conditions here for Northern Cook Inlet, uh, Palmer, Eagle River, Wasilla, most of the Susitna Valley, and mostly marginal in the central interior. And then IFR for the central Arctic coast and west central North Slope down to the Brooks Range. Areas of IFR here, St. Lawrence Island, Yukon, Cusquam Delta Coast, and into the southwest interior, along with some VFR mixed in. And then a big uh, swath of marginal VFR here from, oh, uh, Southwest of the Pribloff, so St. Paul, St. George in a VFR situation Wednesday afternoon. Passes, Anatuvik and Adigan both look uh, marginal tomorrow. And for Lake Clark and Merrill, marginal VFR. Rainy looks marginal. And Windy also looks kind of marginal. Uh, Isabel, though, marginal VFR at times, but I think uh, Mintasto, you'll be VFR. And then it's back to uh, marginally marginal for Tanita. And Portage, though, IFR, while Chilkoot and White start out marginal and then gradually uh, during the afternoon time frame become IFR. And for the freezing levels here, surface still way up into the northern Bering Sea there near St. Lawrence Island and it kind of meanders down across the southwest interior and north of the North Gulf Coast here and then into the panhandle, but that, that flow pulling 6,000 foot, the southeast flow pulling 6,000 foot freezing levels all the way up to the Arctic coast and North Slope. And uh, with that upper level ridging right through there, pretty sharp ridge and for icing, areas of uh, isolated moderate rime icing possible here uh, above 5,000 feet, southeast coast and eastern North Gulf Coast. Uh, small area here, Kodiak Island, also around St. Lawrence Island and then kind of a widespread area of possible uh, mixed or rime light icing out here with just a slight chance of anything that would be considered moderate. And for the jet stream, pretty elongated trough here from the Russian Far East uh, down to well south of Kodiak Island. Flow around that southeast, uh, pretty brisk, not all that strong. 60 knots, 60 to 90 knots over the western interior. And at 9,000 feet, a little more impressive here, uh, 40 to 65 knots here from the south southeast of that low. And uh, 20 to 25 eastern interior. And for the uh, 3,000 foot winds, 20 to 30 knots along the panhandle. Westerlies 40 to 45 knots in the Aleutians. And uh, up to 60 knots, St. Lawrence Island. That takes us to turbulence. Look for moderate chop. Uh, the uh, immediate coast of the Panhandle there up to the eastern North Gulf Coast, much of western Alaska down to Kodiak Island and the Aleutians. Technology. It's the rhythm of our everyday life. We're more dependent on satellite and communication systems than at any other time in history. Disruptions can affect our economy and even our safety. To prepare for the effects of such events and minimize impacts, we need to look outside our atmosphere, some 93 million miles away, at a star we call the Sun. It's our main energy source. 
It warms the earth and grows our food. While the sun and the space between may seem pleasant from our perspective, it's anything but peaceful. At its surface exists a chaotic state of eruptions and radiation. And unlike Vegas, what happens at the sun doesn't stay at the sun. Space weather is essentially emissions from the sun, uh, radiation, magnetic field that erupts from the solar surface, pumped out into space, sometimes right towards the Earth. When it impacts the Earth, it impacts our technology. That's what we call space weather. These solar events and their effects at Earth can disrupt systems we take for granted. From causing blackouts to the power grid, to delaying offshore drilling operations due to inaccurate GPS data. Interference with communication systems can force air traffic to reroute and impact rescue response and coordination. Outside our atmosphere, solar radiation can harm astronauts and the systems they depend on. The good news is that these eruptions can be detected early. Forecasters at the NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center in Boulder, Colorado, have their eyes on the sun at all times. The Space Weather Prediction Center is part of the National Weather Service and is very much like a normal weather forecast office. We're here 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We're looking at data, we're looking at imagery, we're looking at model outputs. As conditions develop, we put out alerts, warnings, and watches of imminent activity to our customers so they can take action. In many ways, forecasting space weather is a lot like forecasting hurricanes. Those who rely on space weather forecasts, like electric power grid managers, are informed early on and can begin taking protective action. When we see an eruption on the sun, space weather forecasters will issue a watch. This is much like a hurricane watch. When a hurricane sits offshore of Miami, for example, perhaps 48 hours out, we too can see way in advance that something may be coming towards the Earth. As the storm moves toward us, it hits a monitoring spacecraft orbiting a million miles away from Earth. It's kind of our, our buoy sitting out there offshore and that hurricane about 30, 45 minutes before it makes landfall, we'll get the measurements from the buoy. That's what the spacecraft does for us. That big eruption that left the sun hits the spacecraft. Now we've got the measurements of exactly what's going to impact us here on Earth. And we issue the warnings to give the power grid a heads up that the storm is now imminent. An interesting element to this whole process is that when the forecasters issue the alert, the power grid receives the alert, takes the necessary actions to protect the grid, the average citizen never knows anything ever happened. The number of customers who rely on space weather information continues to grow. As our reliance on technology increases, so will our need for constant monitoring of the sun. Space weather affects technologies. As conditions develop, we put out alerts, warnings, and watches to our customers so they can take action. GPS has changed society. Most people don't realize how remarkable and how many different applications there are. The GPS has become an integral part, not just of our daily lives as far as cell phones and guidance for our cars and mapping, but the whole uh, system in agriculture is really relying heavily on high accuracy GPS. 
So they're using GPS to plant those seeds with centimeter accuracy. And then they can come behind it and, and irrigate and fertilize right where that seed is with that one centimeter accuracy. The GPS creates a line for the operator that he can steer along. Or you go to another level and the operator doesn't steer anymore and the tractor has an automatic steering system on it, much like a cruise control on a car, except for when I push the button, it doesn't drive a set speed. When I push a button, it stays on a predefined line. You don't even need lights. You can do it at nighttime. You program your GPS and it's driving that tractor for you. So it's, uh, it's huge and it's changing the way that the farmers farm the fields. Six or seven days out. There's an interest in GPS applications from the space weather side because when the sun is erupted, it causes GPS to falter and in some cases it doesn't work at all. Productivity may suffer to a certain degree in that there's no way that I as a human being can steer as good eight hours a day as a, a GPS system is going to do. It's going to be the same all day long. Some of the other application technologies those are going to be gone. We're not going to have the ability to do good section control on sprayers and planters and fertilizer applicators without GPS. We see a huge growing customer base in so many different industries, so many different sectors now relying on GPS and high precision GPS. They're all big customers for us. And now, marine weather around Alaska. Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed the uh, segment. Uh, today's sea ice analysis continuing to fill in here in the Chukchi Sea on down to the Bering Strait. And, uh, of course, things are getting a little, uh, uh, the growth is going to be slowing with the uh, storminess coming in once again with that storm cranking up the, or heading up the north, or to the northwest along the southwest coast. So ice will take something of a beating due to that. And for the coastal water forecast, we've got small craft advisories, mostly uh, southeast winds, 25 knots, except north coast here, north central coast, uh, south at 30 knots, 16 foot seas. Light winds, Lynn Canal out of the south at 10 knots, southeast 15 for Stevens Passage, and 20 knots southeast release for Clarence Strait. Those become uh, small craft advisories uh, for Clarence Strait on Wednesday, out of the southeast with 10 foot seas, and southeast 20 for Passage Canal, or I'm sorry, for <laughs> Stevens Passage, and North 20 for Lynn Canal. Full gales here along the coast, out of the southeast on the south coast, out of the due east on the north coast, and those seas up to around or a little above 20 feet. And Prince William Sound, uh, look for much lighter winds today after those uh, 65 mile an hour wind gusts that were reported in the sound today. 15 knots for tomorrow with three foot sea southeast 20 there for the Middleton Island area. Otherwise, uh, the Barren Islands and the western North Gulf Coast and Kachemak Bay, east winds, 30 knots, and southern Cook Inlet, east at 25, and then northeast 20 for northern Cook Inlet. North of the Forelands on Wednesday, look for an increase in these winds, sustained 30 knots, 6-foot seas, and then good gales here, southern Cook Inlet, south of the Forelands, into Kamishak Bay, northeast at 40 knots, with seas uh, 11 to near 20 feet. East 45 for the Barren Islands, 25 foot seas, and then 40 knot easterlies for the North Gulf Coast and Prince William Sound, northeast 25 seas at 5 feet. Kodiak Island, east winds 30 knots, seas 15 feet. And uh, east 20 from uh, Akiak here on down toward Castle Cape, and then 20 knot northeast winds for the uh, south side of the Alaska Peninsula, north side south at 20, and Bristol Bay southeast at 15 with 6 foot seas. Bristol Bay on Wednesday, northeast 40, or I'm sorry, northeast 40, Shelikoff Strait, northeast 35, Bristol Bay, and then west-northwest 25 to 35 here sweeping across the Alaska Peninsula, and then uh, east at 30 there for the Kodiak Island area, 
and moving on to the Fox Islands tomorrow on Alaska Island. Not too bad. West Southwest at 15, Unmac Island Northwest 20 to 25 knots, seas uh, 11 to 15 feet. Central Aleutians, Adak and Atka, West Northwest 30 knots, seas around 15 feet. And then gale warnings out over the Western Aleutians, uh, especially for, well, from Amchitka on out to Shimia. And then for uh, Wednesday, they come down just enough to get it under the gale threshold here for the Western Aleutians, west at 30 knots. Small craft advisories, Adak and Atka with those westerlies at 25. And then a little lighter there for the Fox Islands, west 25 or, or 20 to 25 knots. Seas running oh, 10, or 12 to 14 feet. And for the southwest coast, tomorrow, gale warnings out. Strongest along the Yukon Delta coast at 40 knots and 35 knot winds for the St. Matthew Island area, southwest 30 for the Pribilofs. Storm warning, St. Lawrence Island, southeast 50 knots, 15 foot seas. And those come down to 25 knots out of the southeast on Wednesday. And much lighter there for the Yukon Delta Coast, northeast 15. Small craft advisories for the Cuscoam Delta coastline, southeast 25. St. Matthew Island and southeast at 10, pretty light for the Pribilofs. And pretty strong winds here on the eastern Beaufort Sea coast. Almost a storm, but not quite tomorrow. Uh, 45 knots over to demarcation point, slackening off to about 25 knots, still out of the east for the uh, central and west side, and then 20 knots Cape over to Cape Thompson, 30 knot winds Cape Thompson to Wales. Outlook for Tuesday, uh, Wales up to Cape Beaufort, east at 20, then 15 knot winds on the west coast. Central coast really light, east at 10, and then 20 to 30 knot winds on down toward demarcation point. That's the zone that will be the strongest. For tonight, this front uh, really weakens, especially precipitation-wise, as it gets into the interior here, and, uh, but stays quite windy over much of uh, the state with a high wind warning out for the uh, western Alaska range. Got 70 miles an hour, and uh, high wind warning ends for uh, the, uh, pat, or turning an arm in uh, Portage Valley tonight, and winter storm warning stays out for St. Lawrence Island through tomorrow. Otherwise, we're looking at Tuesday, a Storm pulling away, and here's the next system pushes rain into the panhandle. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1 800 WX Brief for a formal pre flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating.